Welcome to the Better Than I Found It podcast. I'm your host, Mike McGraw, the men's golf coach at Baylor. And today I'm going to begin a series of four podcasts over the next couple of months with my current team members here at Baylor. Uh, With this series, I'll be highlighting our seniors on the team. So today's guest is co-captain Colin Kober from South Lake, Texas. Colin and I will talk about his family, his mom, his dad, his sister, who have each contributed to his discipline and his uber competitive nature. He describes his commitment to academics, which I really like as a coach, and and how that's actually helped his golf. Colin and I get real uh, in this at one point talking about a defining moment in our coach and player relationship that was pretty important in his career and certainly in mine. I know you're going to enjoy this interview as much as I've enjoyed coaching him. Please welcome Colin Cobra. Okay, my guest today on Better Than I Found It is Baylor fifth year senior, senior co-captain Colin Cobra. Colin, welcome today. Thank you, Coach. It's good to have you on here. You're the first of, uh, we're going to do a, a series of senior podcasts guys that have been here four or five years, and uh, you're the first one, so you're the guinea pig. <laughs> we'll give we'll, this our best shot. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'd like for the people out there, certainly the Baylor fans and donors and listeners and you know people that are the Baylor faithful, if you will, I want them to get to know you better, but I'd like for a lot of other people to get to know who you are better. You know, when you get kind of inside your own bubble, people really don't get to know who you are, and so maybe we'll kind of come up with some things today that'll explain a little bit about your personality, how you've become who you've become, and all of that. So you comfortable? Ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right. Let's do it. All right. One thing I know for sure is parents have an unbelievable influence on who we become. And uh, obviously, they're in our lives in the first 18 years of our lives more than anyone. So I want to talk about your uh, parents, uh, John and Norma Cober. So I really would love for you to tell me about your dad's story. He's an, a great success story in my opinion. So if you could just let me know a little bit about John. Yeah, John, uh, he's a really important person in my life, um, an extreme competitor in everything that he does. Uh, he has a little different background. He came from Western Kansas. He's the only child, um, grew up on a farm, 6 a.m., waking up, uh, getting cold water, walking it to go feed animals, um, just doing any task on the farm that was asked of him. He finished up around dark and then immediately go to the gym and work out. Um, he says he's not a very good athlete, but I know he was putting in the work in the gym and he was one of the hardest hitting guys in football. So you can definitely see the competitive aspect of him from uh, all the hard work that he did in Western Kansas. But there's one thing that he kind of brought from that is just um, – he learned that every day you just got to be better than the, the day before. And I think he really stressed that on me and my sister. Um, for him, academics are the most important thing in the world. He knows that, you know, if you do good academically, you can set yourself up for success. And so just each and every day, just trying to be the best you can be. He really stressed out my sister and me. Um, and then my mom, another extraordinary person, uh, she may be more competitive than my dad. Um, it's pretty incredible. She also grew up in Western Kansas. Um, but the difference was that she was uh, very talented at sports, played a lot of sports. Um, she actually played for the men's teams because the girls weren't good enough right, for her. For sure, in those um, days. So in like those small towns, you know, that's what they did. Um, but she was, she stressed his sports excellence on us. So I got my dad who's pushing academics and my mom who's uh, stressing the sports, but just both two extraordinary people that, you know, came from Western Kansas. And they, I think they brought that down on my sister and me. I definitely can see that, you know, talking to both your mom and dad. Your mom has a hard time watching you play. Yeah. <laughs> That's how competitive she is. She's, it's tough for her to watch. But uh, your dad is uh, very, I, I don't think he ever takes golf too, too much to heart. It doesn't hurt him so bad when you shoot 75. No. Like it, would, <laughs> it hurts you or me. But It's pretty incredible. I mean, just the loyalty he has and just he goes out there, he's smiling. When I'm hitting the fescue, he's jumping around in the fescue. He's not very good at finding the balls, but he tries. You know, we were at Merido a couple of weeks ago, and, and I asked you, I said, is John ready to go to be a four caddy today? He says, you know what? You, you, what'd you tell me? You said... I, I was something like, he'll try, but he's not going to find much. <laughs> he's not very Better good. hit the fairways. On the opposite side of that, Travis McEnroe, who's also a senior on our team, his mother has lost one ball in his career. Yeah. 
So, you know, there, there are extremes in everything. Your dad is a really, really nice man and very, um, but you can see the competitive side, you can see the discipline side. So it's pretty easy for me to see where, where you've kind of developed your personality mm -hmm. traits and the different things that you do. But you weren't always a golfer. You, you played other sports too. Yeah, so I grew up in a family where like we played every sport. My sister, I've got to get a lot of credit to her too. She played volleyball at Kansas State. Um, unbelievable. Um, I think she has the record for most digs at Kansas State. Um, helped them reach the national championship in a few years. I mean, just talk about a competitor. She may be more competitive than me, and I like to think I'm pretty competitive. But, um, yeah, we grew up playing every sport. And so she got into softball. I got into baseball. We used to play catch all the time. And um, she was so good at softball that it kind of just drove me to be good in the baseball. And, you know, I'm six foot, you know, average size guy. So baseball was a really good sport for me. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought I had a good arm at a time until my uh, shoulder gave out on me. What year was that? So in, yeah, in eighth grade, we uh, played a baseball game. Everything was just fine until we lost. And one kid did not like uh, the result and kind of stormed off and made a big scene. And there was just one thing that our coaches did not allow, and that was to make scenes and, you know, have that type of attitude. So sure enough, they have us running sprints afterwards. And the luck of the draw, the same kid that got angry knocks me over while we're running, and I land right on the corner of some concrete. And uh, next thing you know, shoulder's no good and looking for another sports. <laughs> wow, that was it for baseball, no more. That, that was essentially it. Okay, well, that does say something about self-control. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> if that boy had kept his self-control, you might be in Major League Baseball right by now. <laughs> but anyway, no, I'm, we're really glad you're playing golf. And So that was in the eighth grade. You had played golf before, but it wasn't your main sport. Mm -hmm. So now that baseball was kind of gone, you couldn't throw like you used to. You had yeah, to so uh, it was kind of interesting. I grew up on the golf course, Timurong Country Club. Um, and when I got injured, I couldn't do anything like any of the sports that I really enjoyed, but I just went out and I saw golf and I was kind of watching some of my friends play. I was like, I'm just going to hit some balls and see what happens. And sure enough, it didn't really hurt. Um, even when it did, I just kind of ignored it because it was just so much fun. It was refreshing to play golf. And I realized I kind of had a little, a different talent in it, maybe even been better. It may be my best sport. So just really got involved in it. And there was a couple of kids from my home course that, you know, got really competitive and just really enjoyed it from there on, then on. So uh, baseball's loss was golf's gain. Yes. That's good. But, you know, when I got to Baylor in June of 2014, um, I was recruiting all around the state of Texas, and there was a kind of a buzz on the AJGA Tour that summer. A, a young man shot 11 under par, the first guy to ever shoot 11 under par in an AJGA event, and still to this day the only guy who's done that. Do you know who he was? Yeah, I think that was me. <laughs> okay, that was you. But I had never seen you play, and I didn't see you play that summer. You were playing some national events, not much in the state of Texas. But there was an AJGA event at Timuron mm -hmm. in August. So it's one of the last of the summer, and I go up there, and I see your name on the starting sheet, and I say, I'm going to go follow that kid. He did shoot 61 this summer, 11 under, so I'm going to go follow him. And so I remember that was my first introduction to you. You shot 67 that day, and I remember I was on a tee box, and there was a wait, so yep. we had to wait, and you look back, and you saw the Baylor coach, and what'd you ask me? I think I talked about RG3. You did. Yeah. You talked about uh, Robert Griffin the third, and um, <clears throat> so anyway, I walked off, didn't think much else. I, you uh, finished second or third that week, mm -hmm. played it, had a good week. I'm sure you were disappointed because it was on your home course, but you did shoot under par the day I saw you play, and... So I, I circled your name on the starting sheet, and I came back and told Ryan Blagg, my assistant, we're going to recruit that guy. Mm -hmm. And so I think I saw you one other time that fall, and I had Coach Blagg come and see you play. And uh, he said, yeah, we need to get that guy. So then started the process of writing you letters, and I remember thinking, well, what were you thinking at the time? <laughs> I was thinking uh, I wasn't going to end up in Waco, Texas. That's what I thought. For sure. But uh, I had heard so many stories about Coach McGraw, um, like I said, I got into the game later, as we talked about, so I didn't really know much about college golf. I didn't know the history of what teams were good and what weren't, but everyone kept talking about, you know, Mike McGraw is the best coach ever, Mike McGraw this, and I was like, I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know who you were. No, of course But I had that conversation with you on that tee box. I was like, seems like a nice guy. I was like, I have to take a visit with this. He, I mean, I got to learn from him somehow, even if I don't play for him. And then, I mean, that first visit that I had with you, uh, neither of my parents could make it. One was deathly sick, and the other was working hard. 
So I do, I do want to tell that story now that we're in a pandemic. Yeah. So that day, Ryan Blagg and I showed you around the entire campus, yeah. did everything. And uh, you had come down. You felt fine, but yeah. your mother couldn't make it because she had like pneumonia yeah, or flu. She, she or, was not feeling good. She was not feeling well. And uh, Ryan spent the next 27 days in bed. He didn't come back to the almost office. Killed him. He almost <laughs> killed Ryan Black. But uh, I, I do remember that first visit. You came back for an additional visit. I think you brought your dad that I time. Know. And I, I recall, just so people can kind of get to know you, we had, the, I took you to the dean of the business school. And this dean told me in an email uh, about two days later that the questions that you asked of her mm-hmm were better than the ones she asked of you. So you came prepared. I think your dad probably helped you do that a little bit, but you came prepared for this visit. And uh, I think it was shortly thereafter you kind of decided, not too long after, that maybe Baylor would be a good spot yeah. for you. I think there, there's only been one person that's ever been more prepared than me in life, and it may be you. Yeah. <laughs> so that was one thing that really immediately drew me here is, you know, when I was asking those questions and things, you had everything lined up for me, and it was just an uh, unbelievable bit, visit. But well, and the way I look at it, I'm, I was an underdog in the deal because you literally had no real interest in coming to Baylor. Yeah. I mean, we weren't even on the radar. TCU would have been on the radar because it was a, you took golf lessons over at uh, Colonial. Colonial and you kind of knew about their team. And you had a friend, mm-hmm. Tristan Fisher, who was going, who was committed there. Yeah. So, but Baylor, we were not on the, on the radar. And I know you were looking at a lot of other schools like Illinois and mm-hmm. Texas and some others, but... Um, you know, the more I started thinking about it, this is exactly what I want. I want a talented person who's also very disciplined, who I'm not going to ever have to ask this kid, you need to work a little harder. In fact, I've never to this day have not had to ask you that. Don't want to start either. But but I think that that was kind of how we connected uh, initially, which mm-hmm. was great. And then you committed and you won a state high school championship that spring. And then I think you were runner-up the next year, and your team won at least one title in that. We won my junior year. Junior year, yeah. So the year you won, the team also won. And you continued to play well in AJJ events, and you were definitely one of the better players in the state of Texas in your class, for sure. And so uh, before you got to campus, we had a late commitment out of a young man. Who was that? It was Cooper Dossie. Yeah, Cooper. That was uh, a a big surprise for all of us because it was sort of an 11th hour commitment. But you and Cooper have been sort of uh, buddies the entire time you've been here. It's been great. I I think I owe Cooper a lot. Um, He's given me uh, a lot of inspiration on the course, off the course. He's a great human, great teammate. I mean, people see his good golf, but they don't understand that everything that you see out of him, social media-wise, he's as... He's as good as it as it looks, you know, from the outside. Well, and, and the, the thing I really like about it is you guys are senior co-captains mm-hmm. and you're getting to do that for a second time because yeah. of COVID last year. But uh, you guys don't have even similar personalities. I mean, it's not even close. No. So uh, it's interesting that you would be drawn to each other the way you've competed with each other and the way you, you've kind of helped push each other to be better. It's yeah. been been awesome to see. Uh, but you, you, I wouldn't consider his personality anything like yours. No, I mean, he's he's a video game guy. I'm more of the study books type of guy. <laughs> uh, he's a little more relaxed and carefree. I'm a little more uh, serious and, you know, uh, just different, you know. It's different, but there is a side of you that people don't know. You've got a good sense of humor, too, <laughs> but we'll get to that. So uh, you get to Baylor, and uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I, I think there's a couple of overarching things about you that uh, that I'll always remember. And one of them is academics. Uh, I've coached 35 years. Uh, I don't think I've coached a better academician uh, than you. And I've coached some really, really impressive young men that have done really well in the classroom. But right now you're in your fifth year at Baylor. You're getting your master's mm-hmm. in tax. tax. Uh, you have never made a B mm-hmm. at Baylor. I'd like to say I think the lowest you've ever made in a class is about 95 or 6%. So that, that's pretty impressive. But you've won the Elite 90 Award twice. And we didn't, we did, it's, it's given to the player with the highest GPA at the national championship. Now, you would have, in my opinion, would have won it three times, but we, haven't, we didn't get to go to nationals mm-hmm. last year. But that's an amazing award. Um, it's, if, the, the thing that I thought was great was if – you have the, uh, if there's a tie at the highest GPA, 4.0, they give the award to the guy with the most hours. And as a sophomore, 
you had the most hours. Yeah. So you, you've been way ahead of the mark as an academician, and I know you gave credit to your dad earlier, but it does take a lot of discipline to do that. Yeah. It's not easy. It's, uh, it's different. I don't think, you know, some people tell me I don't give myself enough credit for it because of the, I, I mean, kind of looking back on it now, it's easier to see that I played a lot of tournaments, you know, very stressed. I mean, you, you came up to me the practice tee last week and you said, Colin, I can, I can tell that you've got a test today. <laughs> it's like, it's so obvious. I guess, I guess you know me now, but yeah, it's, it's been tough. Um, what's frustrating is, you know, you don't, I don't get to sleep as much going into a tournament as I'd like and some of that stuff, but um, I got kind of that, that drive from my dad just to do as well as I can in academics. And uh, I'm a big believer in how you do one thing, how you do everything. So, you know, if I want to achieve on the golf course, I've got to achieve in the classroom. Um, and I just, I take that mentality kind of in everything. I truly think the discipline that you take, because you are a disciplined student, there's no question, but that same discipline you, you just take over in the way you, uh, where you work out, the way you train at golf, the way you eat, the way you kind of, you, you disciplined your whole life so well that it's the same discipline just across different things. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I want you to know that that's been very inspiring to me because I haven't, I haven't coached anybody who's been more dedicated to their athletics, but is also incredibly or ath academics, but is also incredibly interested in being a great athlete. So that's that's one thing I'll never forget, and I, I'm always going to appreciate that. Probably tell stories, and I'm sure I'll embellish those stories eventually. Ten percent. Ten percent. I'm allowed. But another thing that is uh, always been impressive to me is the nutrition and fitness aspect of your life. I mean, who got that started? Yeah, I think that also just goes back to my family. Uh, we played a lot of sports growing up. Um, my sister, she was always eating healthy, always working out. I mean, I, I could have sworn she was working out three times a day, calling me lazy. I'd wake <laughs> up at 7.30. I was the last one out of bed, like the only one that hadn't been to the gym yet. So I definitely got the fitness from my sister, my dad, my mom, um, and then just eating how well. Uh, once again, I just, you know, looking back on it, I think we just grew up, you know, eating a little more healthy than most families and just taking the time to make sure we were putting the right fuel in our bodies. Uh, that's something that because of fast food, because of expedience, getting it quick, instantaneous things, everybody wants it right now. Because of that, we've taken our food and our nutrition to the wrong place, I think. And I think athletes who really care about their craft will pay more attention to it, and you obviously have done that, which is great. Uh, and you work out hard. You've, you've suffered some injuries since mm -hmm. you've been at Baylor, but you seem right now in your fifth year the healthiest you've been. I mean, you have no pain right now, do you? I mean, you're right where you yeah. need to be. Yeah, I've got my, my program down where I uh, wake up, do my stretches, do my movements, and I feel good for the day. So it's been a large focus on the fitness side. The last three months, four months, I've been battling herniated disc in my back so um yeah fitness is becoming more and more important for me because that's going to be what keeps me going towards professional golf well you're looking for longevity if you want to play professional golf uh longevity is extremely important and golf is a non-contact sport but you're doing something over and over and over and you want to make sure that your body is ready for that nutrition obviously when you're traveling you need to be able to fuel your body the right way so um Academics and fitness are two things I'll, I'll definitely always remember Colin Cobra for. Um, so Colin, I, I have a couple other things I want to say. Um, I, every coach has defining moments or turning points in his career where uh, something will happen with a player or with another coach or whatever and that it will absolutely affect the way he looks at things going forward. Mm -hmm. And so that actually, I had a moment like that with you, and I, I know you're going to remember when this was. But you, you had played uh, your freshman year, you were, you were a bit injured, didn't play very much, came back the next year kind of ready to go and, and got in the lineup occasionally. But when we were at the national championship at Karsten Creek in Stillwater, mm -hmm. you were mm -hmm. as the substitute. You were not in the lineup. Yeah. And I kind of sensed that whole spring – uh, as we were trying to have a battle for the fifth spot, and that didn't work out very well for anyone that was involved. But I could tell you were pretty unhappy, not, not a real, you weren't really excited. It was your second year, and you really hadn't accomplished a lot of the things you had hoped to accomplish. Mm. And so I told Ryan Blagg when we didn't play well at Nationals and we were driving back, I said, we're going to have those individual meetings starting tomorrow. Colin's the first one, and these meetings are going to be different than they've ever been. 
he looked at me like, well, what are you talking about? And I said, just wait, here goes. So I know you remember the meeting. Yeah. You sat down and I asked you the question, Colin, uh, what do you think this meeting is going to be like? How, do you, how, would, how would you uh, characterize it compared to last year, would you think? What do you think I'm going to do today? And you looked at me like, I don't know. And I said, well, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to get real today, you and I. We are going to tell the truth to each other, absolutely the truth as we know it today, right here, right now. And as long as you're respectful to me, you can say anything you want today, Colin, and I'll do the same with you. I'm going to tell you what I think, what I believe about you and your experience here at Baylor. You're going to tell me exactly what you think about me, how I run the team, blah, blah, blah. So I'm telling you, I'm giving you the ground rules for this meeting. And being the kid who you are, because you're really smart, those wheels are turning in your head. And you're going, well, this man set a trap for me. Yeah. There's no question he's going to let me say something that's going to get me in trouble. And I'll preface this before I let you jump in here. I fully expected you to come into the meeting with, Coach, you know, I think maybe this isn't going to work out for me. Maybe I need to transfer. Mm -hmm. I had that as a possibility. So if we're getting real here, I, I basically said, you tell me, the truth as you know it, and I'll do the same as long as we're respectful to it. Finally, you were convinced that it was okay, but I said, do you want me to start? I did, so I start. Now, we're not gonna go into the details of that meeting because I think that's between you and me, but that changed my coaching career, that, that moment, because it, for one, it changed our relationship. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you told me a lot of things that day about things I could do better, and I told you about some things I thought you could do better. So you're, what are your impressions of that meeting? We really have only mentioned it. We've never really talked about it. Yeah, I think it's, it was definitely a pretty defining moment. So there's, I guess I have a backstory too to uh, what I guess your preconceived ideas coming in, thought that there was a chance that maybe I come in there with right. just, you know, doubt and want to leave or whatnot. But something that people don't know about um, that round when I shot 11 under was – just, you know, 25 days before that, I was actually picked to be the substitute for my state championship team as a freshman in high school. So I did not know that. No. So, I mean, I, at regionals, the week before I finished third on the team, I thought I was going to state. But uh, my high school coach, who I think he's one of the greatest high school coaches of all time, I love the guy to death. And this was probably what motivated me to get better, was he sat, he sat, sat us down and he picked his son to play over me. And uh, Mason Greenberg, one of my friends, was healthy, so he got picked to go back in the lineup too. And so there I was sitting on the sideline, debating why I was playing golf. And I said, I you know I remember that week. My dad had said to uh, to my mom, "says you're like that. This may be it. He may be going back to baseball or basketball. He's not gonna play golf anymore, probably." Wow. <laughs> and, uh, so it was a defining moment. Yeah. Right? So I decided from that moment I wasn't gonna let people, you know, take my career and make it what they want. I was gonna decide my my future. And sure enough, you know, 20 days later, uh, I won that AJG event. It kind of spurred everything. And I think that kind of is the same thing that kind of happened in our meeting is, you know, I went in there and I knew I did not play the golf that I should have my sophomore year. I mean, there was no excuse for some of the scores I shot. And when I was putting blame on, you know, the coaches or the people around me, I wasn't really taking accountability for my, my lack of, you know, scoring. <laughs> so um, when we got there, I told you that uh, – the biggest thing that I remember when you recruited me is you said you were going to take whatever hopes and dreams I had. And when I left here, I was going to have that same hopes and dreams. And if anything, I'm going to love golf more than I loved it before. Right. And I did not love golf at that time. And I think there was a lot that was on both sides why it wasn't working. But I can tell you right now, three years from that meeting, this is the most I've ever loved golf. I love it more than I've ever loved it before. I'm excited to come out here and practice every single day. I love my teammates. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting from that meeting is, you know, the kid that I was battling for that fifth spot, Brian Greider, he's my roommate, mm -hmm. one of my best friends now. Yep. We practice every single day together. Uh, we work out together. Um, so, you know, when coaches say they're going to, you know, change things or defining moments, that's a true defining moment. It's not one of those, you know, we're just going to talk and nothing's going to happen. Something happened, apparently. Right, and, and that's why I told Ryan Blagg on that, in that van on the way back from Karsten Creek, these meetings have to be different. Mm -hmm. We have to... We can't check off a box tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's got to be something real. And I remember uh, that that time when you were you were going back and forth. I, mean, I almost cried in that meeting. And you know, you're a pretty tough guy. I like to think I'm a tough guy, but I've got emotions too. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had been failing you because the one of the three promises I made to you, I was failing on. And it was like 
this kid doesn't even love golf anymore. And he's telling me that right now to my face. I did not like golf this spring at all. So I was pretty, pretty torn up by it. But I also knew this was a chance for us to move on. You know, the, the one other thing that it should be mentioned, you weren't a substitute that went up there with a chip on his shoulder and angry and bitter and mad. You went up there and at least you gave the appearance of being one of the greatest cheerleaders ever. You were fired up. Let's go get them, guys. And we didn't play well. It was hard to... It's hard to cheer that week, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. I mean, that was one thing. I Like, I grew up, like, you know, if you don't get picked for something or something doesn't go your way, you don't just quit and you don't just play the sorry card. And um, I, The first thing I did when I, I knew I wasn't playing at Nationals was I texted the kid who had the spot, Ryan. I said, I hope you play really well. I hope you win. I hope, you know, the coaches make the right pick here. And I, I hope you know I'm your biggest fan this week. And, you know, I think that's important as a teammate, as – you know, just the friend of your teammate, you just got to be like that sometimes. Well, I just wanted you to know, I've never even really told you that too much. I appreciated that a lot. That was that was a hard week for our team. Would have been really hard if we'd had the substitute being a jerk or mm -hmm. something. And yeah. you you put on a pretty a good face, you know, put a good front on. And then, uh, and then, of course, when we got back, you and I had that meeting. And my coaching career has changed ever since. For one, our relationship is better. It's deeper. It's more of a player coach, like I like to have a relationship be. But number two is I, I'm aware now that if I make a promise to somebody, I've got to do everything in my power to keep it. Mm -hmm. And that is this kid needs to love the game. And if somebody else is, that's playing for me right now is not loving the game, I hope he listens to this podcast mm -hmm. and comes in and has a meeting with me. Let's talk about this, yeah. coach. So that was a really big moment for me as a coach, and I appreciated you uh, sharing that. Um, so that summer – we, uh, Coach Blag and I kind of came up with an idea and I created a survey mm -hmm. and I wanted to give this guys, give you guys the survey right before we had a team retreat. And the survey was to be filled out anonymously and turned back in. And so lots of questions on there. You remember the survey quite well, don't you? Oh, I do. <laughs> okay. Well, and remember we had had all those individual meetings and talked to guys about things we thought should change and things we should do better. And so I knew you had two months to work on some of this. But so the survey was filled out. And, and the first deal was everybody was supposed to give three characters, characteristics that jumped to mind about a person on the team and or a coach. And then uh, write those down. So that was 11 people giving three characteristics apiece. So there would be 33 characteristics about Colin Kobe right there. And then the first question was name one thing you really like or admire about a teammate, mm -hmm. and that all nine players in the team filled that out, and then the negative, too, something that bothers you a little bit about your teammates. Now, you had to put something there for yourself, too, as you think your teammates might think you, because otherwise, if you left that blank, I would know who it was, <laughs> and I wanted these completely anonymous as far as who actually said what, but I'm going to go through some of these characteristics. You ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here they are. Colin Cobra characteristics, single-minded, intelligent, always thinking, competitive, cynical, hardest worker I know, grinder, competitive, smart, loyal, intense, tends to be antagonistic, mm -hmm. negative attitude sometimes, pessimistic, stubborn, very intelligent, unbelievable discipline, dedication to fitness, funny and quick-witted, driven, logical, hard worker, brilliant. There's a little bit on both sides of the scale right there, isn't there? There's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. When, we, when I compiled these and you and I were having that meeting right around the time we had the retreat, I handed it to you and I, I said, read this and then let me know what you think. And you looked at it and you read through it. And you looked at all the characteristics, all those characteristics I just labeled. And you handed it back to me and said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Do you remember that? That's about right. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. But there's so many good things in here. And I think you're every one of those things that they said. But are you, is there some truth in some of the things that bothered them as well? Yeah, so I think, you know, this is a time where I was kind of battling through golf, trying to get in the lineup. There was a lot of negativity. And, and, you know, anyone who plays golf knows that, you know, there's some frustration that comes with it. Um, but one thing that kind of came out of that meeting, I think, if we did that survey, survey again, I think um, – you know, I'm definitely still that person that's driven. That I'm definitely the uh, some people would say negative, some people would say rational person. Um, but I think overall, I've kind of changed from that. And I think that was kind of a good learning uh, experience. Was just kind of seeing what the other teammates think of you. Uh, one thing that I 
I guess the favorite thing that I've heard this year about me, I guess, is, you know, they were talking about the COVID situation, how we've all dealt with it. And I remember one of my teammates said, you know, Colin, you're actually one of the most positive about the situation. I was like, I didn't think anyone would ever say that about <laughs> me, but that was my goal coming into this is just make the most out of every single thing that we've got, even with this COVID going on. So I think that was a good learning experience. Um, definitely some truth to it, but you know, if you, you know, learn from it and grow from it, I think it's really good. That's great. I mean, and it does take a, a little measure of humility mm -hmm. to look at something. And, and I, I had those same things said about me, you know, good and bad as well. And so you have to look at it and see, there's always some element of truth in there, always. Yeah. And so we can all get better. I uh, appreciated the humility it took for you to, to make some of those changes. And obviously the strengths that they felt you had are all just as valid today. I think it's great. We're going to take that survey again later this year. So we'll see how we all do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Baylor golf since you've been a freshman mm -hmm. and all the things that we've accomplished. So I'm going to read through some accomplishments here and then a couple of your own as well. So at one point, we were ranked number one in the country for two weeks. Uh, it's never happened in the history of the program. We were regional champions in 2017. We made match play at the national championship that same year. We won the 2018 Big 12 match play championship. We won the 2020 mm -hmm. Big 12 match play championship. We've won 10 titles overall and, and 10 times been runner-up. So 20 times have been first or second during your time here in tournaments. In those match play championships, you went 12-3-0. So I want to talk about that. And you've had six top tens as a Baylor Bear. So that's a lot of accomplishments, things that had never happened before at Baylor. And you've been a big part of that. It's been an unbelievable experience. I think it's really cool to see how our team's kind of progressed over the years. Um, it's kind of interesting, too, when you look back my freshman year, uh, Matthew Perrine, Braden Bailey, Garrett May, Hunter Shattuck, and there's, like, what they built and how we try to continue it. I think uh, through the years, we've just gotten better and better, and I hope to continue to see that. Yeah, we have. And, and this gets back to the fact that last year, Coach Black and I made you and Cooper co-team captains. We did something we hadn't done before. We sort of coached you up early, talked to you about it, had meetings with you early to try to let you know things we expected from you. And so we were going through that COVID year. I think we were ranked... 12th in the country. we just come back from Cabo and uh, getting ready to go to Florida for a tournament and they canceled our season. Mm -hmm. So I want you to tell me what you and Cooper did because you guys got together and kind of made a pact of sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, the well before the NCAA said they were going to give a year of eligibility back to the seniors. So. Yeah, so I was actually practicing at the Billy. Um, I remember walking in, hearing about Florida's canceled. And I immediately, my brain starts racing, thinking the season's done. And I kind of go to Coach Blagg. He comes back. He's like, yeah, there's a good chance it's done. Um, so we find out it is officially done. Uh, about you know two hours later, uh, Cooper is actually out of town at the Canada Q School. Uh, I don't remember where. I think it was Florida, North Carolina, something like that. And I call him and um, just to kind of speak to me and Cooper's relationship, I mean, we've been through a lot together and we've really enjoyed being teammates. And I just remember saying like, it, it's over. And uh, I could hear him crying on the other side. And like you said, I, I like to think I'm a tough guy, but even I start crying. I said, you know, if I get the chance to come back, I, I think I'm going to do it. Like I can't, I can't end like this. And, you know, he had a great year and he was looking good going into professional golf. And I was like, I, I don't expect you to come back because I know you've got a lot of opportunities and all this. And, but man, if we get one more chance together, I'd really love to do it. And the person that he is, he, uh, about two days later, he calls me back. He goes, I want to come back. I was like, let's do it. And so I think we came into your office and said, we're going to come back. You did. And, and that was before anybody else in the country had announced it. And actually that was before the NCAA had said, we're definitely giving you that year back. And a few days later, they said, we're giving everybody one more year of eligibility. And you guys were spot on, ready to go. And I just wanted you to know, that was big for me. It was big for our program that you guys would come back to get unfinished business taken care of. You know, we had a good team, a really good team that had a chance to make a deep run last year. And hopefully you've come back to try to make that happen this year. Yeah. I, I mean, I just want to have go out on the, on the right note. And I think uh, Cooper and I just, you know, we promised you one thing. That's where we're going to battle for a national championship. That's our only goal. And so 
like you said, it's unfinished business. We'll see where it takes us. So let's talk about this yeah. year. We, uh, we've finished the fall season grateful and thankful that we got to play. We got to play three tournaments. We finished fourth at Colonial. We won the Big 12 Match Play Championship and finished fourth at Merido. So we, we know that we left a lot, a lot in the tank this mm -hmm. fall. We had a lot that we could have done better, but we're excited about that match play championship for the second time in three years. So before we move on, I'm going to ask you what you think this team will accomplish this spring. Just throw something out there. But before you do it, I want to talk about this. You were, you've been in 15 matches in three Big 12 match play championships. You're 12 and three. That's a pretty good record. Yeah. You must take some pride in, in a head-to-head -head battle. I wish it was 15-0. Oh, but uh, I got you. That's <laughs> I love it. I do like that there's more wins and losses for sure. But as long as the team's winning, that's the most important thing. When you line up someone against me, one goal is to beat them. And uh, I think I've done that a few times. So um, yeah, You've done a really, really good job of that. And to, to think that we're going to be fitted for our second Big 12 match play championship ring, that, that's pretty... I don't know, pretty exciting for me as a coach because, you know, I'm getting a little later in my career. It's sort of the December <laughs> of my career. And to still have teams that are accomplishing those kinds of things, that's really gratifying for me. So what do you think we're going to accomplish this year? Where do you think this is going? I, I know we can't predict the future, but. I think, uh, you know, a lot of teams say they, they're going to win it all. They're going to do this, they're going to do that. I think this team has the talent, we have the work ethic, and we've got the chip, chip on the shoulder. Um, I think we can win it all. I think that's our single goal, and I'm really excited with every single piece that we have this year and the way we're working, and I know we're a dangerous team in match play. That's what I know. Okay. Well, I, I like that. There's no way to predict what we're going to do this spring, and we're, we're just hopeful we're going to have a spring season again, but I'm really excited about what we have in front of us. And again, unfinished business. You guys go out there and take care of that. So let's talk about post-June 1st. So you've, you've helped us at the national championship, hopefully, and uh, you're going to you're gonna obviously have a career in something. What do you think that's going to be? Are you going to play professional golf? I'm going to play professional golf and give it a shot. Um, I think the way I've been playing over the last few years, it's trending up. I think my health is the best it's ever been right now. Uh, like I said before, I'm the most excited I've ever been about golf, and I, I couldn't be more excited to wear a Baylor badge as I go out and play professional golf for sure. Well, we'll make sure we... we uh get the BU on your golf bag yeah, when I'm, you're... I'd like that. A swinging bear would be great. I know. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, uh, I just want to... Before, we're going to do a speed round here in a minute, which I think you peaked some of the questions, but we're going to do a speed round. Before we do that, I just want to say thank you so much. You've been an amazing person here for four years, a great team captain. I know that you take a lot of pride in the discipline and the things that shape your life that way, but uh, you've, you've made a huge impact on the program. And I'm thankful to have been your coach. We're not done. You and I have some unfinished business. But thank you so much yeah, for all that. I'd like to say the same thing. I think uh, for anyone who's listening right now, when you hear the stories about Coach McGraw, he's as good as it. Uh, every single story has been true. This guy is an incredible coach. Um, we have the best assistant coach in the world right now, Coach McKell. Um, unbelievable reader of the putts. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. So uh, I, uh, we've got unfinished business, but I mean, just so thankful that you had me come into this program and that you've upheld all those promises since then. It's been great. Well, thank you, Colin. I appreciate you saying that. So let's do this speed round. Okay. So I'm just going to ask, you can take a, you know, as long as you need to get the correct answer, but here we go. All right. Your favorite, favorite pro sports team. Dallas Mavericks. Luca. Dallas Mavericks. You're not a Cowboys fan right now, is it? Just not I, quite your you, favorite. I wear my uh, my, uh, my Cowboys stuff even when we lose. I, I've <laughs> noticed that about you. I've noticed that about you. Favorite pro golfer? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, very much so. Steak or fish? Steak. Had a boy. Chipotle or Chick fil A? Chipotle. <laughs> Chipotle for sure. Remember the Titans or Shawshank Redemption? Shawshank Redemption. Had a boy. George Strait or Luke Bryan? Careful before you answer this. George Strait or Luke Bryan? Yeah, Luke Bryan's not country, so it's going to be George Strait. Yes, Colin. I knew my training. <laughs> I knew my training. It helped you finally. <laughs> Favorite golf course you've actually played? Pebble Beach is as good as it looks. I'll, I'll go Pebble Beach. Very nice. Uh, a course you'd most like to play? Ooh, anything. St. Andrews would be really cool. That would be great. Dream Force and you and three others, who are they? Could be dead or alive. It doesn't matter. We go me, Tiger Woods, Luka Doncic, and Boban. Wow. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, that's not what I expected, but I like it. How many holes in one have you had? 
Zero. Okay, just the six for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, sorry about that. That's okay. You'll get one one day. Keep I, trying. I knew that was coming. Yeah, I knew. Just you save did. that for Cooper too. I, I would definitely save that for Cooper. He's got a grandma who's made nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite Coach McGraw, McGraw quirk. Now keep it limited to three, but your favorite one. My favorite one. Uh, the be. most disgusting one. Yes. I'll tell a story about it. Okay, go ahead and tell a story. Okay, so we're eating at this Italian restaurant. I can't remember when. But I challenge Coach McGraw to a food eating contest the fastest. That's a mistake now. It usually is, but not for me sometimes. I okay. Do. All right. Okay. So we're sitting there, and I get spaghetti extra meatballs. So he goes, spaghetti extra meatballs. And we're uh, about to get, we get the food, whatever, and I start eating. And I'm going as fast as I can. And he's going as fast as he can, or so I thought. And I have him beat dead to rights. He looks over at my plate, and you can see the look of distraught on your face. Mm, I was nervous. And you just kicked into another gear. And maybe the most disgusting gear I've ever seen is you start <laughs> using your hands to finish this bowl. And I'm over here with my fork, and you've got the hand motion going. And now there's food flying in the air. And at this point, I said, I will not. I'm not going to have a contest when we eat with our hands. So I, I stopped it right there. You finished your bowl, and you won. Colin, the lesson <laughs> you need to learn this is if you ever get in a fight in a dark alley. You don't want to fight the guy who's not afraid to die. I put my life on the line there to win that eating contest. Yeah, well, you know, you've never watched Batman then because the person who's willing to, or doesn't want to die okay. is the most dangerous. I don't, I don't watch <laughs> I don't watch Batman. I don't, but okay. All right, so that's one quirk. Any others? Is that about it? Nah, that's the one. Okay, it yeah, definitely food. <laughs> that, that's a problem. Well, Colin, thank you so much for joining us on Better Than I Found It. Let's, um, let's keep working toward where basically in the off season now so let's let's make sure it's a great off season keep, keep encouraging your teammates and let's um, let's do some great things this spring sounds good thanks for having me coach all right thanks a lot colin